Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey. Welcome back. Today we're discussing Chapter 6, adapted from David Emery Shy's America and Narrative History. This particular chapter deals with the inaugural years of the United States, now that we've gotten through the Revolution. Okay, so we're going to talk about the formation of the U.S. government, all the different aspects that go along with it, and eventually the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. So bear in mind, at this point in time, America is really the only constitutional democracy that exists anywhere in the world, and it's a republic at this point, okay? So a constitution doesn't even exist yet, okay? So this is a, a, a government that really exists without precedent, okay? Uh, before now, again, all the other countries in the world are, have been operating as monarchies, okay? With rulers who either rule by the rights of parliament or, in some cases, by what they consider to be divine authority. And so this is really the only time where we've had a government that exists um, as a, a functioning entity uh, operated by the people themselves, or at least ostensibly. And the government itself and the nation at large is really born out of this common ideological conflict with monarchy, to say that monarchy is something that is outmoded, outdated, and has the, uh, the opportunity to be corruptible. Okay? And so um, all the other monarchies in the world at this point are all um, operating on the basis of a shared ethnic identity. Okay? So each one of the major European powers uh, has been largely, um, I guess you could call it mono-ethnic in the sense that um, there really hasn't been any foreign interference that much with, uh, you know, with their own uh, governments, right? They, there have been plenty of wars, to be sure, um, but, you know, all of England is populated by English people. All of France is populated by the French, okay? So at this point in time, America has been populated by at least four or five major European countries, not to mention Native Americans, and, of course, we've had the introduction of African slavery within the past 150 years, okay? So America is already becoming much more diverse as a country than any other country in the world at this point. And the basic ideology that America is trying to put forward at this point, and again, it bears the weight of a lot of cognitive dissonance at this, at, at this particular juncture, but they say that the people should be able to govern themselves more than anything. Okay, This is the basis for a democracy. The second is the one that is um, still in major conflict at this point in an internal way, because um, the the idea that people should have an equal opportunity to prosper doesn't necessarily extend to all people at this point. Okay, we we refer to people as a uh, as a pretty generic term. Okay, and the modern form of people here in the 21st century is really not the same uh, definition as what it would have been back in the 18th century. Okay, as horrible as it sounds. Right, when we refer to people in the 18th century when this government is being built, we're really referring to white males. Okay, um, these are people of European descent. Okay, Native Americans don't actually uh, be made citizens until uh, the 1920s, and of course, African Americans, as we know, don't actually gain the right to vote or even uh, emancipation until the 1860s. Okay, so we are still quite a way uh, away from these uh, types of advances, and of course, even women don't gain the right to vote until 1920. Okay, so white males are really the only ones at this point who are considered quote-unquote people, again, as horrible as it sounds. And the idea that the government is supposed to exist to protect liberty and promote the public good is something that, um, they, that the people of the United States are really trying to push forward as uh, kind of a foil to the government of England in the way that it's been reacting uh, to American independence up until this point, okay, because the um, the whole idea of the British monarchy has been something that has uh, been viewed as a tool of oppression, right? Uh, you know, the whole taxation without representation trope uh, and uh, just all these uh, really cruel laws that have been handed down that have really strangled the economy of, of America before it becomes an independent entity. Okay? So we're trying to move away from all that and make a benign government that exists uh, by the will of the people. And the Confederation of Colonial States that we discuss here is the, the group of um, the original colonies that have uh, rebranded themselves as individual states that eventually unite into what we now call the United States. Okay? And this is where we get the original motto of the United States. It's the Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, which means out of many, one. Okay? It's a pretty straightforward definition there. 
the biggest obstacle, though, that the Confederation government has before the United States government is ever actually fully built from the ground up is the fact that uh, it bears the weight of $160 million in war debt, okay? And in 1783, that is a massive amount of money, okay? We're talking, uh, you know, a, a war debt that's well into the trillions by today's standards, okay? And, and the... Um, you know, the value of the dollar in the United States has, has changed so dramatically over the centuries that at this point it's, it's almost impossible to, to be able to, um, you know, to uh, calculate that, how much it's changed. Okay? Um, but at that particular point in time, that was the equivalent of 20 years worth of the national budget for a fledgling government. Okay? So the fact that it is that far in debt uh, with no real way of, you know, pulling itself out of it puts the, this new country at a very, very vulnerable state, okay? So it would be very easy for another power to come in and attempt to take over, um, and it does eventually happen in that particular regard uh, a few years later with the French Revolution, okay, which we'll talk about eventually here. Uh, three of the biggest questions, though, that we encounter in the late 18th century now that uh, this new country is, you know, being formed is, number one, where is sovereignty going to reside? Because, again, in a monarchy situation, um, sovereignty typically resides either A, with the monarch, or B, with a church that is actually, you know, either operating in tandem with or over the monarch. Okay. So with many countries like France and Spain, right, sovereignty relies primarily with the Catholic Church. Okay. And with other countries like England and, you know, the, uh, you know, the Netherlands and so forth, we have local churches and local uh, monarchs who are the heads of their local churches. Okay. So here, the question of where sovereignty is going to reside, since we've separated church and state, since we don't have a monarch, um, the, the whole idea is for sovereignty to reside within the will of the people. Okay. The proper relationships of the states to each other in the national government is another big issue, uh, and it becomes the, the basis for the first real big political debates in the country because people are so worried that a national government is going to become tyrannical and end up taking over the will of the states. Okay. So uh, this is where we have you know, the, the question of state governments versus a uh, federal government that come into play. And what all are we going to need for this republic to be able to flourish? I mean, we're, we're already starting out at a pretty sorry state as it is, economically speaking anyway. Um, and we've got several ideas in the pot now, and whether or not it's all going to come together or not is really up in the air. Now, between 1783, the year that Great Britain recognizes the independence of the United States, and 1787, we have several different political and economic debates that come out, okay, because this is really the, the formational period, okay. Um, we are just now at the stage where we have been approved as a brand new nation, and now we have to build everything from scratch. And again, this is where the birth of the first political parties comes into play. Uh, and the political parties at this point, there's only two of them, okay, just like we have primarily in the United States today, but the landscape of political parties is very different because uh, at this particular juncture, we don't really have, uh, you know, fully formed political parties with distinct agendas, okay? At this particular juncture, we're talking about political parties that exist uh, based on what they want this new country to look like. Okay. First group are called the Democratic Republicans, okay? And uh, it seems like a contradiction in terms because today, of course, we have Democrats and we have Republicans as the two primary political parties. Okay. Um, but democratic republicanism, the ideology behind it, says that we need to have a representative democracy that exists by the common people and for the common people. Okay. In other words, we don't need a small group of men making all of the decisions for everybody. Okay. Everybody should have a say. Okay. On the other side of the aisle, we have what are called the Federalists. Okay. And the Federalists uh, are the ones who do believe that should be a small group of men making all the decisions, the quote-unquote better men. Okay. Uh, they believe that uh, there should be a sharing of power among a national government, a state government, and local governments. Okay. And eventually what we see after the country does form, uh, over time, all of these ideas eventually do end up coming together in one form or another. Okay. So we're still at a, at a point right now where uh, again, not everything has been fully formed, and not everybody agrees on how this new government and the new country should be run. Um, and even though we are 
at the stage where the patriots who have fought against the British crown, who have kicked most of the loyalists out, confiscated their property and everything, have won the war, um, the patriots have actually ended up turning around and uh, rebelled against this brand new government almost immediately. Okay? Uh, not because they disapprove of the existence of the government, but because, number one, the military has gone completely unpaid for the entire duration of the American Revolution. And remember, it was a really impoverished war to, uh, to speak of it in those terms, okay? because we had an IOU system in order to basically say we are going to owe you this amount of money when everything is over, if and when we do win the war. And people, uh, you know, for one reason or another, didn't realize that there's not going to be suddenly a hoard of money that's going to appear out of thin air. And the other thing, too, is now that we actually have a formed government, um, even though most of the country has been largely impoverished because of this war, um, this new government has suddenly decided to raise taxes to try to cover the war debt. Okay, so it's been, uh, it's been made very, very unpopular in the eyes of the people for this reason. Okay? People are already beginning to distrust it because suddenly it's asking for money. And the Articles of Confederation, uh, which is kind of the template for what we eventually see morph into the U.S. Constitution, says that each state is going to, quote, retain its sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Okay? Um, and this is what causes um, uh, people to kind of look sideways at this a little bit, because people are concerned that uh, each one of the states is going to try to retain an independence in and of itself without actually unifying. Okay, so really, these states are united states in theory only. Okay? They, they don't really, again, they still have varying uh, religious backgrounds, forms of government, and so forth. And so not all of them are on board with the idea of a national government overseeing them. Okay? They still believe that this could potentially become corrupted and become a new form of tyranny. And right now, we only have a one-house legislature. Okay? Today, in the 21st century, of course, we have Congress, which is a two-house legislature. Okay? We have the Senate, which is the upper house, and the House of Representatives, which is the lower house. Okay? But at this particular point, we only have one house. Okay? And this house only has one delegate from each of the original 13 colonies. Okay? So we only have 13 members in this legislature. And this is before we end up uh, coming up with the three different branches of government, too. So we don't have a president yet, we don't have an executive branch, and we don't have a national court system either. Okay, So it's really uh, a, a starter set, so to speak, for, for a government right now. Uh, so the state legislatures only appoint members of the Confederation Congress with one vote per state. So we only have one real member for each one of the 13 colonies again. Um, and it's very limited in terms of what it can do. Okay? It can't enforce any treaties. It really can't levy taxes in an official way. It can't enforce it anyway. Okay? And it can't draft soldiers. Okay? So it's a government really without a whole lot of teeth right now. And the budget really relies on voluntary contributions from the state. So this idea of the new government asking for money um, for to be able to fund things to uh, to fund taxes, you know, to repay the war debt is something that's only voluntary. Okay? It expects a certain amount of money and it doesn't get what it wants. Okay? Uh, in 1782, for instance, right before um, the uh, you know, the, the country is actually ratified in the, idea, in the eyes of Europe. We asked for $8 million from the states, this new confederation government does, but only $420,000 is sent. Okay, so, a, a, you know, a fraction of a fraction of what is actually needed to start this government is sent. Okay, so not everybody is willing to back up a new government in, in this regard. Uh, and also, there's virtually no gold or silver coins to speak of. So any paper money that's printed in the colonies is, in this new country, too, is worth about two cents on the dollar. Okay, so it can't really even do a lot of business with any other uh, nations of the world yet. Now, in terms of the land itself, okay, because the, this new country has been able to uh, obtain a massive amount of land that has been uncultivated and unsettled by Europeans anyway, uh, or has been at least partially settled by the British and the French, uh, we have to decide what we're going to do with it. Okay? Um, first thing that we have is a land ordinance that comes out in 1784, and this divides the Native American lands into 14 self-governing territories. Okay? Uh, and again, this is the, the beginning of the period where the U.S. government starts to make promises to Native Americans about not, uh, you know, not illegally acquiring land from them without their permission, but then turning around and doing it anyway. Okay, 
I said, this is really the beginning of a lot of the official native grievances. Um, and the land ordinance says that all adult white males are eligible to vote, hold office, and write constitutions. So this is, you know, trying to implement some of this idea of, again, the who the quote-unquote people are of this time period, right? The people who this government is going to directly affect, right? Who is going to have a voice. Land ordinance of the next year, 1785, is a little bit more organized in what it does. Okay? It says that uh, we're going to survey the land itself and make new sales in the Northwestern Territory in the Great Plains. Okay? If you look here at the map, um, all of the area that is in the, the bright yellow at the bottom of the map is area that has already been uh, primarily settled. Okay, this is area that has been, um, you know, taken as part of this uh, new treaty and everything. And part of this has been, again, settled by you know, the, uh, the British colonists for, you know, a couple of generations by now. But the, uh, the three states here that say Northwest Territory, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, right, before they actually become states, uh, is kind of the target for, um, for land surveys and sales here. Okay. And we haven't quite gotten all the way into the Great Plains just yet. Okay, That's still in Spanish territory for the most part. Um, but what this does is it takes the native lands and it divides them into six square mile townships. Okay. You see here uh, what a, a township uh, ends up comprising, Okay, about the size of it. Um, it has 36 separate one square mile sections. Okay, then you see here divided on this little grid. And there are four farms in each one of these little squares. Okay. So basically what they're doing here is they're giving equal sized land parcels to individuals and they're not really even giving them. They're dividing them up and then they're auctioning them off so that people who can afford to buy the land will end up purchasing it and settling the territory. Um, and all the proceeds end up going toward the national treasury, try, trying to build up the coffers of this new government so it can actually have a little bit more authority over time. The Northwest Ordinance that we get in 1787 says that all new Western territories are eventually going to become states, and they have to go through a specific process in order to do this. Slavery ends up being completely banned north of the Ohio River. Okay, and the Ohio River is what we see here um, at the bottom here that borders between uh, the orange states and the yellow ones. Okay, so everything above that is going to be completely slavery free. So people are already looking at slavery as being something that they want to get rid of. And this ends up standing uh, as, as something for, uh, you know, again, well uh, into the Civil War era. Okay, so just a little under a century. Uh, and again, this is still continuing this broken promise strain that we have where native lands are going to be taken without consent, even though the government promises not to do that. And it's a three-stage process for statehood to actually occur. Okay. Congress has to appoint a territorial governor okay, for any, each one of these territories. Officials in the area have to create a legal code and a justice system in order to back it up. Okay. When the population of adult males reaches 5,000, then a territorial legislature can be formed. And finally, when the full-size population reaches 60,000, then the territory can grant, uh, draft a constitution and apply for statehood. Uh, and this is still kind of following on what the Land Ordinance of 1784 does as well. Uh, originally, the idea was for a territory to uh, reach the population of Rhode Island, which I believe was about 20,000 at that time. So it ends up in increasing it a little bit more uh, just because these territories are so big. Now, when it comes to foreign diplomacy at this point and how it relates to the economy, um, relationship between the United States as a new country along with uh, Spain and Great Britain is very, very tense, okay, because we've just ended a pretty, uh, pretty rough war that's left a lot of sour grapes. Um, both Great Britain and, and Spain are still keeping trading posts, forts, and soldiers on American soil well after these, this war has ended. Okay. And Spain really doesn't have, um, it hasn't really interfered that much here, but it's already on the borders of where the new United States actually is. Okay. So on the other side of the Mississippi River and even into the state of Florida, which has just been recaptured in 1783. Okay. So there's still a little bit of overlap into American territory here. Um, both Britain and Spain continue to try to uh, get Native Americans uh, to, you know, 
get over the fact that they've taken over their lands, okay? And they even say to the native tribes, go ahead and attack the Americans who have taken your lands, right? Because we promised you that we we're going to give them back, and we've ended up losing the war. So you have our permission and our blessing to attack our enemies. And the British refused to remove any soldiers uh, until the uh, debts are fully repaid. Remember, the United States government has made the concession it's going to repay all of its pre-war debts to, um, you know, to merchants and so forth, from the Boston Tea Party, for example. Um, and Americans are continuing to act aggressive towards uh, toward loyalists, right, toward the Tories. Okay? They continue to seize property. They're still lynching people. Uh, so things have not really died down in any real amicable way. Okay, this is the the period that quite often gets glossed over when it comes to you know middle and high school level history classes. Okay, it's a it's a pretty bitter period, and a lot of England born Americans are actually kidnapped at sea by the British Royal Navy and are impressed into service. Okay, they are actually uh, you know fully fledged kidnapped and taken over to the British side. Okay, so. Um, if Americans venture very far beyond American soil, they run, they run this risk, okay? And this actually ends up uh, becoming one of the, the biggest issues for probably the next oh, 20 or 30 years until we get to the War of 1812, and it's one of the primary reasons why we fight that particular war. And again, Spain ends up regaining control of Florida in 1783, and it gains control of the Mississippi River as well, okay, and ends up trying to close it off to American use. Remember, this is a, a primary um, uh, trade highway, really, from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, okay, so to close off American trade to that is really to strangle America quite a bit. And again, the economy of America is really in a bad state. Okay? Uh, we're completely bankrupt from the war debt, for one thing. Um, there's over 60,000 slaves who have escaped and have ended up hurting the southern economy because, again, the south has still relied very, very heavy on slavery even this early on. The military has been completely unpaid, okay, so you have an actual uh, military body that's already rebelling against the government. And all civilians that are owed supplies, livestock, and more from the war still have IOUs that they're trying to cash in. And to make matters worse, to add insult to injury, the British, who have uh, retained control of the Caribbean islands, end up closing them off to American commerce. So American, America can't really do a whole lot of trade with many countries uh, outside of its own soil. Okay? It still has a little bit of, uh, of an agreement with France to be able to control a few things, to be able to trade a bit, but that's really about it. And the U.S. vessels are not really allowed to take British goods anywhere in the world. Okay? Uh, the British have you know, put this, um, you know, this particular law in place or this, you know, regulation or whatever to where it will actually seize ships and, you know, take the, take the cargo away and will then kidnap the sailors and press them into service. Okay. So um, America is, even though it still exists as a, an actual entity, it's still being very heavily bullied by the rest of the world. And the U.S. states end up taxing British vessels at different rates, too, okay? So if a British vessel goes into a port in Massachusetts, it might have a much higher uh, tax on it and on the goods on board than if the ship goes to, say, Charleston, South Carolina, okay? Um, and so all the different states start to get into competition now with one another, okay? Who is willing to uh, do more business with Great Britain? Uh, who's willing to, you know, uh, grant trade concessions and so forth. So, again, not all of the states are fully united at this point. And, again, there's still no national currency that is stable, okay? We have no gold or silver coins, and uh, most of the bills and debt payments at this point have to be postponed, okay, simply because there is no money, okay? Um, this is one example of an early form of American currency. It's a third of a dollar. <laughs> it's a, a dollar note. Um, and this is uh, from a, uh, the Congress staff at Philadelphia, uh, February of 1776, okay? And actually, if you look closely here, you'll see the original motto of the United States. It says, mind your business, <laughs> okay? And that was uh, thought up by Benjamin Franklin, by the way. So only three American banks exist right now, one in New York, one in Philadelphia, and one in Boston. Uh, in between 1785 and 86, seven different states began printing paper money for indebted farmers and unpaid military members, but usually the money is only good in those particular states. So if you have money that's printed in Pennsylvania, if you go to Connecticut, your money is useless. 
So this is still a, a really unsure phase right now. Now, once people start to realize that the economy is going to suffer for quite a while until the U.S. begins to get on its feet, um, a lot of people are starting to get more and more worried that this um, uh, wealth gap is going to end up increasing okay? because we still have plenty of people in the colonies now the states that have uh, inherited massive amounts of money they're still sitting on a lot of this money and there's a lot of people who are still poor farmers okay and so there's a worry that a lot of the um uh, the, the class struggles that have gone on in england between the wealthy and the peasants are going to end up coming over to america now as well okay so this idea of quote unquote traditional authority uh, that's given to aristocratic farmers is suddenly uh, challenged in a very violent way so the idea that this, uh, uh, you know, aristocratic class is going to have what's called hegemony. Okay? Hegemony is basically authority that is uh, taken for one reason or another over somebody else. Okay? Um, so people of the country, right, the commoners are starting to say, you know, because of these new ideas and what America stands for, we're not supposed to be able to, you know, give any kind of deference to our quote unquote betters. Okay? There are no betters, right? If we are actually all equal, then everybody is equal, right? There's no, nobody should be in the upper class or lower class, okay? But again, this is only in theory rather than practice. Um, the, the whole idea of equality, though, does say that more men can vote and hold office, right? You know, despite the fact that they uh, might be peasant farmers or if they're aristocratic planters, right? It doesn't make that much of a difference at this point. Um, and most Americans who have large war debts start to protest the tax raises than anybody else, okay? So people who uh, have, you know, given over a lot of supplies to the war effort, uh, people who have lost money when it comes to uh, trade with England or with France or something like that, if they're independent planters, um, they, it, you know, they end up paying nearly three times the, the rate that they did before the war. So not everybody is really um, benefiting from the outcome here. Um, and again, we start to see, you know, different farmers and former soldiers that are demanding. Uh, money being printed uh, to provide relief, okay, and not all the governments are willing to do this. Okay. Uh, in Massachusetts, for example, the legislature that is um, made up primarily of merchants refuses to do this, okay. and we actually get a group of armed regulators, right, soldiers who um, uh, say that, you know, we're not going to allow the government to seize our property. We're going to show up with guns and actually prevent them from doing this by force. And this becomes kind of the, the basis for the, uh, the Second Amendment argument. It's basically saying that, um, you know, if the government tries to come out and, and take things, people have the right to defend themselves, uh, you know, with, with guns if necessary. Okay. And enter uh, the, the figure of Daniel Shays here. Okay. This is where we get the, the term Shays Rebellion. Uh, Daniel Shays is a veteran of the American Revolution who takes uh, a group of men uh, to the federal arsenal in Springfield, Illinois in 1787 and tries to basically take over the federal arsenal so that he and his group can arm themselves. And they get a force of 4,400 militiamen who meet them there and prevent them from doing this. Okay. So they have to actually, you know, come toe to toe with the federal government and then are forced to stand down. And immediately thereafter, the state finally agrees to, you know, wind down some of the taxes and the fees just because they don't want another um, war on their hands. After Shays' Rebellion, people start to realize that a, a brand new constitution of some kind needs to come out to actually unify people because the Articles of Confederation are really not doing the trick. Okay, this uh, is going to be a growing country that's going to need uh, many more working parts than what actually exists in order to keep order. So in 1787, uh, Alexander Hamilton calls for this large national gathering of different delegates from the states to amend the Articles of Confederation and create a brand new document. So we get four months of deliberations where men are working five hours a day, six hours a week, uh, five hours a day, six days per week, I beg your pardon. Um, until we get a brand new constitution that is fully united and signed on September 17th. Uh, and of course, unsurprisingly here, all of the delegates are white middle-aged men. Okay? The individuals that we've already established are the, the quote unquote, quote, people of the time. And what we say by that, again, is I'm not, we're not, you know, uh, 
denigrating people down to less than human. We're talking about people who have the right to vote, to hold office, and that sort of thing. Okay, so this is why the government of the United States, when it began, uh, wasn't really thinking long term. Okay, it wasn't thinking that one day all slaves would be completely freed, or that they would be given rights, that Native Americans would be given rights, or that women would be given rights or that we would have massive amounts of immigration from other countries and other nations with other ethnic identities. Okay, so this is a, this is a very short-term thing that people are thinking about here. Uh, 22 of the people who are involved are veterans of the revolution, okay, and eight of them are signers of the Declaration of Independence. So we have people who have been uh, involved in this process from the very beginning. James Madison is one of them. He is a, a political theorist and a tobacco plantation owner. Okay? He's responsible for a lot of the theoretical elements of the Constitution. Um, and he strengthens the national government in particular by giving power uh, uh, to the people rather than to the states. Okay? So in other words, we're not looking at the states uh, influencing the national government so much as the people themselves. Okay? So if there's a consensus about who the people want to lead them, for example, the states really can't interfere. And this is where we get the creation of uh, a division of uh, branches in the government, right? And this is what we refer to as federalism, okay? And this is supposed to create some kind of stability, some kind of order to where one branch can't really um, outweigh the other two without the other two keeping it in check, okay? So the system of checks and balances that we constantly refer to here goes along with this. And there's two plans that are um, you know, conceived in the midst of all this. One is called the Virginia Plan, and this says that we have to have a tripartite national government, three branches, okay, with a bicameral Congress, two houses of Congress. Okay. And immediately people start to say that this is diminishing states' rights, it's too federalist, right? It's not going to give enough power to the states and to the people, okay? It's going to be too big of a government. The other one is thought up by a man named William Patterson. It's called the New Jersey Plan. And this says that we need a unicameral legislature, right, only one house. We need congressional taxes. We need a chief executive, and we need a Supreme Court. So if, if you're looking at any of this and any of it sounds familiar, it's because a lot of this ends up getting adopted. And ultimately what we see here is what's called the Great Compromise. And this is a combination of the two plans, the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan. Okay? And this is what ends up uh, becoming the basis for the national government that we have. Okay? Um, it says that the more populous states in the union are given more representation in the House of Representatives okay? by saying that you know, we need to apportion a certain amount of delegates who are going to represent the people. Okay, so this is why if you have a, a state like Texas, for example, uh, it has many more um, representatives in the House of Representatives than, say, New Jersey, for example. Um, and equality exists when it comes to state representation in the Senate. Okay, each state has two members of uh, two Senate representatives, okay, two senators. Okay. So, and they're all elected by a legislature, um, and this ends up uh, going on for several years. So we have a legislative branch, which is Congress, okay? and this is what makes the laws of the country. Okay? Anytime a brand new law comes out, begins as a bill in the House of Representatives, moves on to uh, the Senate, which then ends up voting on whether or not to ratify it and turn it into a law, then it gets sent on to um, the president's desk. And once the president signs it, then it officially becomes a law. And the legislative branch is the one that has the ability to declare war on other countries or to make peace. So we have the House of Representatives, which is the lower house, right? This represents the common people, okay? Voted by um, the common people, right? right? You vote your local representative into office, your local congressman. And members are elected every two years by individual citizens. So this still continues forward to today, right? Every two years, we have congressional elections in the House of Representatives. And then we have the Senate, which represents the state legislatures. Okay, this specifically has to do with ratifying state laws, with eventually ratifying national laws. And the Senate has members that are elected every six years by a state legislature. And the Senate is really supposed to be the balancing force when it comes to that and the executive branch. Okay, uh, it can also overrule the House of Representatives or it can overrule the president as well. Okay. 
So it ends up being kind of the balancing act between the two. The executive branch, of course, is where the president exists, okay? And the president's job is to enforce the laws that are made by the legislative branch. Okay? So executive branch not only includes the president, uh, who is elected for a four-year term, okay, but it also includes law enforcement, uh, police, which eventually come about much later on. Uh, and the president can veto an act of Congress, but the Senate can still overrule that veto. And a president can be overridden by a two-thirds majority vote in each house. Okay. So the president is the chief diplomat of the country, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And a president can be impeached by the House of Representatives. Okay. What this means is that uh, basically if a president's conduct is out of line with uh, demands of the office, House of Representatives can look at what the president has done, can convict the president of you know, of performing an action that they don't agree with or that is believed to be unlawful somehow. Uh, and then the case gets sent over to the Senate. And if the Senate looks at this case and says that the president is in fact guilty of what are called quote unquote high crimes and misdemeanors, then the Senate can choose by a two thirds majority vote to remove the president from office. Okay. Uh, in the entirety of uh, the United States history, um, the Senate has never actually removed a president from office. Okay, uh, we've we've had situations where presidents have resigned, where they have been impeached, but any president who has been impeached has yet to be removed from office. And the president is elected by electors. Okay, these are people who are chosen by the people in each state, which we now refer to as the electoral college. Okay, so even though we have a popular vote that exists for president, who the people want to see become president, it really comes down to the electoral college when, when the final decision is made, who becomes president and who does not. And finally, we have the judiciary branch. Okay? This is the Supreme Court, the justices, and the courts themselves. Okay? And the judiciary branch's uh, designation is to interpret the laws that are present in the U.S. Constitution. Okay? All the laws or the amendments that have been made, right, is something, uh, you know, out of line when it comes to certain court cases and so forth, right? Are the actions of what a president does uh, just or unjust in that regard? And it's, it has nine justices that are headed by a chief justice, and the justices serve for life until either A, they retire, uh, or B, are impeached, okay? Or, in some cases, until they pass away. And the judiciary branch with the Supreme Court in particular is supposed to be the highest court in the country. So any other district, local, or state courts end up answering to the Supreme Court ultimately. Okay, so filters uh, the different court cases uh, upward, right, from local courts to, you know, districts to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, regional courts and so forth, all the way up the chain to state and eventually federal courts. And this is supposed to give citizens equal justice under the law, right? It's supposed to be kind of an oversight committee. And naturally, as we've discussed already, there have been plenty of limits uh, that people have recognized from the very beginning concerning the Constitution. Um, the primary limit is that it's written by and for white men. And again, this has to do with the fact that people are not really looking too far into the future again. And that's not to make excuses for what these people did. Okay. Um, it's not to say that, you know, they were uh, acting, uh, you know, ignorantly or they were acting cruelly. They were acting in the uh, situation that they believed was best, that was the best that would serve them at the time. And again, they were not really taking into consideration the idea uh, that people would eventually uh, be considered equal under the law, right? That slaves would be free, that Native Americans and women would have the right to vote eventually, okay? Or that the country would turn into what it is in the 21st century. And again, not to make excuses for them at all, okay? um, but a lot of the ideas that are embodied in, uh, in the Constitution and you know, all these founding documents and in the, in the minds of the founding fathers themselves are based in, on Enlightenment era ideas, which if you look at them in the modern sense are extremely limited. Okay? Um, a lot of the you know, deductive and inductive reasoning that's used during the Enlightenment era uh, is extremely primitive by modern standards. Okay, um, it's kind of the equivalent of uh, the uh, you know the scene with the witch and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you're a fan of it, right? 
uh, you know, saying going through this kind of ridiculous line of reasoning to arrive at a conclusion. Okay? So sometimes it makes sense to us today, and sometimes it's completely out of line. Okay? And so in many cases, especially with this, it's out of line. Uh, when it concerns Native Americans in particular, at this point, they are considered to be separate nations, okay? And they're not made citizens of the United States unless they pay taxes, okay? And they're not granted universal citizenship, again, until 1924. Okay? So all the way until the 20th century, Native Americans are considered to be separate nations subject to the laws of the federal government. By the time we get to 1787, though, we have made a couple of steps in the right direction, okay? Uh, we have four states that have already abolished slavery entirely, okay, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Um, and when it comes to state representation, uh, we begin to look at the question of how slaves are going to be counted among the population, because southern states at this point have a larger contingency of people living in them, okay, and this includes slaves. Uh, in some states, uh, South Carolina in particular, over time, there is a larger population of slaves than there are actual white slave owners. Okay? Uh, and so this ends up, uh, again, becoming a, a, a controversy here because we have states in the South that have more state representation based on the idea that there are slaves that live there, okay? but the slaves are not considered people. They're considered property. And so this is where we get what is referred to as the three-fifths compromise. It's a, uh, again, it's one of these Enlightenment era ideas that is actually extremely outdated. Okay? And it basically says that slaves don't count as a full person. They count as three-fifths of a person. Okay? So again, being uh, you know, as uh, inhumane about this <laughs> as it sounds, this, is, this was the, the logic of the time. And again, this gives the states disproportionate power in Congress when it comes to the South. Okay, and this is why the South ends up getting what it wants so far uh, in the early stages of the U.S. government. Okay, increases the number of votes in the House of Representatives, and unsurprisingly, most of the uh, first U.S. presidents are all Southern slave owners. Okay, uh, in fact, the first 16 presidents, that is. So all the way up until 1848, we have Southern slave owners as presidents. And again, women are still being completely dismissed uh, when it comes to political rights of any kind. Uh, not for lack of effort, though. Okay? Uh, we have individuals like Eliza Young Wilkinson, uh, who is a war widow, says that women have the right to vote. They have the right to practice politics, think freely. And we have Judith Sargent Murray. Okay, she's an author from Massachusetts who says that women should have equal rights with men after the war happens. Okay, if we're going to fight for equality, let's go all the way. Okay? And she actually writes a book in 1790 called On the Equality of Sexes. Right? So she's a, an early stage first wave feminist here saying that the idea that men have intellectual superiority uh, is really um, based on the idea of male prejudice. Okay? It has nothing to do with any intellectual disabilities of any kind. And the idea of immigration is something that is still left in a very vague state at this point. Okay? Um, it states that free white persons, quote unquote, are allowed to become citizens after two years. Okay? And the, the question of, quote unquote, whiteness is something that um, scholars have actually looked into well into the 19th and even the early 20th centuries, and even well into the, the late 20th century for that matter, uh, concerning who can, quote unquote, pass as white. Okay? Because over time, of course, we start to see ethnic distinctions begin to fade. Okay? We start to see individuals who are coming from Central Europe, from the Mediterranean, uh, who perhaps have darker skin, but are not considered black. Okay? So we have, um, uh, once the U.S. Census begins to try to categorize people, again, largely based on these ideas of Enlightenment era concepts of race, right, trying to categorize people into only three or four categories, um, it becomes more and more difficult to, um, to define this particular language, okay, so it has to change over time. And the status of free blacks in the United States at this point is determined only by the individual states, okay, the federal government refuses to actually come up with an overruling um, opinion about this, okay, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the southern states are holding so much political power, okay, and so to allow the south to kind of do what it wants when it comes to this ends up setting up a template for what eventually burgeons into the issue of slavery in the south right before and during the Civil War. Now, 
when it comes to the Constitution itself, now that we've come up with this idea of a great compromise, now we enter into the debate where the political parties come into play. Okay? The Federalists are advocates for the Constitution. They're led primarily by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, the men who have actually authored the Constitution. And they have a concrete proposal. They have a document, okay, the Constitution itself, right? This is their actual full-fledged united plan for what they want the government of the U.S. to look like. And most of the people who support the idea of the Constitution are a younger crowd. Okay? They're more organized. Uh, they have been thinking about this for a long time. They've been working on it for a long time. And on the other side of the aisle are the Anti-Federalists. And again, the Anti-Federalists are not the same thing as the Democratic Republicans. This is just two parties that uh, end up are on different sides of the aisle when it comes to this particular debate. Okay? We still have the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans as the first actual political parties. But in this case, we're just talking about two camps uh, in, in this particular debate. Okay? So the Anti-Federalists, unsurprisingly, are against the Constitution for a variety of reasons. Okay. And they're led by uh, several different uh, groups of people from specific states. Okay. So we have individuals who had parts to play in the revolution, like Patrick Henry, George Clinton, Samuel Adams, uh, all of whom you know come from different states, uh, disparate states too, Georgia, New York, Massachusetts, Maryland. Um, and the problem with them, though, is that they are not fully united in a particular alternative to the Constitution. Okay? They have so many differing ideas of what they want, right? whether they want it to be uh, edited, amended, or completely rewritten, that they don't have a unifying front. And their primary concern here is that this idea of a federal government is going to turn into something uh, tyrannical and corrupt. And they also criticize that there is a lack of a Bill of Rights for citizens. And this is where we end up uh, gaining the input of the Anti-Federalists to create a Bill of Rights over time. And so between 1787 and 1788, we get the Federalist Papers. Okay? It's 85 different essays that are written by James Madison, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, who eventually becomes the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And what this has to do with is they defend and they outline the concepts for what a strong government is going to be and something that is not going to be subject to tyranny because of how big it is okay? and because we are suddenly have a much more diverse population. Okay? Uh, people have so many different interests that, um, uh, it, that the government itself is not going to be able to overrule the people. So between 1778 and 1790, all 13 states end up approving the Constitution based on the Federalist Papers. New York is established as the nation's capital in 1789, and the new government ends up assuming power that very same year. And eventually, we have the first 10 constitutional amendments proposed by Congress that is referred to as the Bill of Rights. So from this point forward, we can now begin to look at the fully formed, fledgling United States government with a constitution, with a president in the form of George Washington, and we'll start to see how the first couple of administrations end up playing out. So we'll talk about all of that in the second part of this chapter.